وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today we're going to cover and go over the kitab السير إلى الله والدار الآخرة the kitab السير إلى الله والدار الآخرة the journey to Allah and the hereafter this book is written by a great imam it's written by a great scholar. His name is Al-Shaykh Al-Allama Abdul Rahman Ibn Nasir Al-Si'di Rahimahullah. Before we talk about the book, let's talk about the author's biography Rahimahullah. This book, or these lines of poetry that we're going to cover, is written by Abdul Rahman Ibn Nasir Ibn Abdullah Ibn Muhammad Al-Sa'di Rahimahullah. And some scholars, they say Si'di. Both is said, Sa'adi and Sa'adi. The Sheikh was born in a place called Unayza. Min A'mal al Qasim. It falls under Qasim. And he was born in the Islamic calendar, the 12th of Muharram, Sanata Alfin wa Thalathi Mi'atin wa Sab'in lil Hijra. 1307. That's when he was born, 1307 Hijriya. The Sheikh, he grew up fi kanafi walidihi in the household of his father, tarbiyatan saliha. He had a good upbringing. His tarbiyah was very good. Lakin Allah subhanahu bar Allah took away his father from him qabla an yablugha before he could reach Sa'di, the age of 10. Before he reached the age of 10, his father passed away. So he lived after that under the care of his oldest brother, Hamad. Hamad took care of him. But Hamad was a wise man, a righteous man. فوجهه, he directed him towards Islamic knowledge and the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He aided him, he supported him. So the Shaykh rahimahullah had an older brother that played the role of his, of his father. The Shaykh Rahimahullah, he took knowledge from great scholars. From them is a Shaykh Ibrahim ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Jasir. He took from him tafsir hadith and usul al-hadith, a mustalah al-hadith. He also took knowledge from a Shaykh Muhammad uh, ibn Abdul Karim ibn Ibrahim ibn Salih al-Shibn. And he took from him fiqh and usul al-fiqh and the Arabic language. He also took knowledge from a Shaykh Salih ibn Uthman ibn Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn al-Qadi. And he took from him a Tawheed and other than that. He also took knowledge from a Shaykh Ibrahim ibn Salih ibn Ibrahim al-Qahtani. He took from him Tawheed. And he also took knowledge from a Shaykh Muhammad al-Amin, Muhammad al He took from him Tafsir, Hadith, and the Arabic language. The Shaykh rahimahullah, his role was uh, a, a person who used to give reminders, lectures. He used to lead his masjid and he used to sit down to do fatwas. So he was a wa'id, a person who uh, had effect on people's hearts. And he was an imam, so he used to lead the prayer. Well, ista, and he was a mufti, meaning he used to give fatwa in Qasim. People would come to him. Rahimahullah. And he was also a person who was very merciful, very, very merciful, kind and generous. They said one day he came into the masjid and I lived in Qasim for a period of time. When Qasim gets cold, it gets cold. It gets very cold if you don't have the right clothing for it. So he came into the masjid and he saw a poor man in the masjid, frozen, cold, shivering. And so what the Sheikh did was he took off his upper garment and he shrouded it around the, the poor man and he, rahimahullah, sat down away from him. So he was that type of person, very, very kind and very soft. 
Rahimahullah. He wrote many books. His books have now passed 20 something volumes. They, bought, they, they published it all together, his Rasail and his works. It's passed 20 something volumes. But from the well known books that he's wrote, written is Bahja to Qulub al Abrar. 99 hadiths he gathered from the Jawami al Kalim, the Prophet's comprehensive speech. Hadiths which are very little in wording but very powerful in meaning. What he did was he took 99 hadiths, he brought them together and then he explained it. He explained it in that book of his, Bahja to Qulub al Abrar. He also has an, a little ta'liqat on the book written by Ibn al Qayyim, Al Kafiyat al Shafiyah, Fil Intisar Lil Firqat al Najiya. He has a little ta'liqat, a little commentary and points on it. He has an explanation on the Kitab al Aqidat al Wasatiyah and he called it Al Tanbihat al Latifa Ala Mahtawat Alayhi al Wasatiyah min al Mabahit al Manfiyah. He also wrote one of the most, one of the greatest tafsir of the Quran. Rather, in some of his tafsir words and things that he brought out from the ayat, you may, you may not find it from any other person except him. And his tafsir book is Taysir al Karim al Rahman fi Tafsiri Kalam al Mannan. And Alhamdulillah, recently it came out, published, I think, 10 volumes, right? In the English language. Recently it came out. The international publish house, they brought it out. The fifth book that I want to mention that he also published was known as Manhaj al a small book in fiqh. And this book of his Manhaj al is a kitab haqiqatan, uh, very strong in Dalil. His aqwal are very strong in Dalil. And the Shaykh was really affected by the works of Shaykh al Islam Taymi and Ibn al Qayyim. He loved those two. To the extent that his words, they were similar to the words of Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn al Qayyim. He has a two volume book where they gathered all of his fatawa where they called it Fatawa al Sa'diyya rahimahullah. This Shaykh, he's the teacher of Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin. He's the teacher of who? Shaykh Muhammad ibn Salih al Uthaymin. Ibn Uthaymin learned from him. And Ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah, he said that he was the one that affected me the most in his tarbiyah, in his akhlaq, in everything about him, and also his knowledge. Walidhalik, Shaykh ibn Uthaymin said one time, I left. Qasim, when they opened the university, Jamaat al riyadh they opened the Ma'had side, they opened the institute side. Okay, and so Sheikh ibn Uthaymin said, we, I moved from Qasim and I came to the university, Jamaat al riyadh the Ma'had side. I enrolled, I came, but in my heart I felt so bad that I left behind my teacher, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Nasir al Sa'di. And so he said, I came to the classroom and then a man came in who was wearing flip flops. You know, very simple clothing was not appealing. He came and he sat down and he started to explain. And then he said, as soon as he came in, I looked and I said, why did I leave my teacher for? Why did I leave Sidi for this man? But do you know who this man was? It was Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiyati, rahimahullah. It's the author of the Kitab Adwa al-Bayan. He said he spoke and he opened his mouth and he started to explain the dars. He said, my jaw dropped. Whatever topic we went in with him, he was, it was like he was that was his subject. Rahimahullah. So Sheikh Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, Rahimahullah, he took knowledge from who? Uh, Abdul Rahman Nasir al-Saudi, Rahimahullah. He died, Rahimahullah, qabla tulu' al-Fajri. He died before Fajr on a Thursday when it was the 23rd of Jamad al-Akhirah. Jamad al-Akhir, when the year was 1376, uh, before he reached the age of 70. So he died at the age of 60 to 69. He died at the age of 69. His life can be found in many books. One of the best books that you can find is Ulama Najd by Bassam. Mashahir Ulama Najd by Qadi. Al A'lam by Zirikli. Mu'jam al Mu'allifin by Lil Kallaha. Or Rawdha al Nadirin by Shaykh al Qadi. Rahimahullah. This book that we have in front of us that we're going to cover today, inshaAllah ta'ala, all of it, it's a book that he wrote when he was only 23 years old. He only wrote it when he was Sittatan wa Ishirin Ama. He was 23 years of age, Rahimahullah. So if we calculate it now roughly, this book is over 90 years ago. 95, 90, 90, 90 to 95 years ago, this book was written. The Shaykh wrote it, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. This book, the reason I chose it is because it's a Mandoma Akhlaqiyya Tarbawiyya. 
It talks about akhlaq, manners. It's a book for heart softening. It talks about ibadah. It talks about loving Allah Azza wa Jalla. It talks about turning back to Allah and repenting to Him. It talks about how a person should carry themselves and the way that they should be. And knowledge like this, there's no place better than to take it from the words of the great scholars, those who lived and those who live. Naam. The author started by saying, Sa'ida, happy are those. Sa'ida alladheena tajannabu subul arrada. Happy are those who avoid the destructive paths. They stay away from it. And what do they do in return? وَتَيَمَّمُوا لِمَنَازِلِ الرِّضْوَانِ And they aim for the stations of Allah's pleasure subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, they turn away from the paths of destruction and they go to the paths that are pleasing to Allah azza wa jalla. They turn away from the path of shaitan and they th- turn to the path of Ibadul Rahman, the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They stay away from the path of Jahima, the hellfire, and they go to the path of Jannah. They stay away from sins and shortcomings and errors. They stay away from it. And they come with righteous actions. They protect their hearts, they protect their tongues, and they protect their limbs, and il muharramat, the things which are haram. Also, they protect their tongues and their hearts and their limbs from the al-makruhat, the things Allah dislikes subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what do they busy themselves with? Washagaluha and they busy themselves with bifi'li al-wajibat wal mustahabbat. And I want you to always remember this. If you don't busy yourself with the obligatory things and the voluntary things, your body and mind will busy you with the prohibited things and the disliked things. Always remember that. If you don't preoccupy yourself with the things that are obligatory on you, the mandatory things, or if you finish the mandatory things, then busy yourself with the voluntary things. If you don't, your body will busy itself or your mind and your nafs will busy itself with either the muharramat or the makruhat. So these people, what they understood was they preoccupied themselves with what? The wajibat, the things that were obligatory on them, and the mustahabbat. And so because they're always occupied, the mind doesn't have what? It doesn't have uh, the desire to go and do anything else. Subhanallah, I was reading the biography of the great scholars of this time, uh, of this ummah, I mean, not this time, but this ummah. And that was uh, uh, the great Imam Ibn Qudama al Maqdisi and his brother, Abdul Ghani, his cousin, Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al Maqdisi. This time I'll mention a female. They had a sister called Amina, Minti Muhammad. She was a sister of the scholar Ibn Qudama al Maqdisi. She was his sister. She was his what? She was his sister. She's the sister of the author that wrote 30 volume book. They said that she was a scholar, an imam in her own self. She was an imam in qiraat and etc. Ala kulli hal, they said, uh, or one of the great scholars, his name is called Diyauddin al Maqdisi, rahimahullah, he said, I traveled with her. The reason why he traveled with her is that he was married to her daughter. And Diyauddin al Maqdisi was called. Muhaddith al-Sham, the Muhaddith of Sham, Imam, Alam, Abdul Wahid, Ibn Muhammad, his name was. So he said, I traveled with her. And he said, Wallahi ma ra'aytu, by Allah I never saw, rajulan, aw imra'atan mithluha, a man or woman like her. No man or no woman have I ever seen like her. And I swear by Allah, he said, I don't believe that that journey that we were, that we were on that the angels wrote anything against her, any shortcomings. The reason is because she was busy with her dhikr. So she busied herself with that which is beneficial for her. سَعِدَ الَّذِينَ تَجَنَّبُوا سُبُّلَ الرَّدَى وَتَيَمَّمُوا لِمَنَازِلِ الرِّضْوَانِ Naam. They come with two strong points. And that is what? 
They are ones who are sincere in traverse, traversing the path or traveling to Allah Azza wa Jalla. They are sincere in that. Their path, their going to Allah is ikhlas. They're doing all of this for Allah wa Taala. There's no one else in their hearts. They all mean this everything for Allah wa Taala. The author is going to mention it later. Harakatuhum wa suku harakatuhum wa humumuhum wa humumuhum lillahi la lil khalqi wa shaytani. He's going to mention that to you later. Their movements, their speech, their everything is only for Allah wa Taala. They don't do anything for to please anyone, to get a reputation from anyone, to be praised by anyone. All of them is ikhlas. Because they know the ayah wa ma umiru illa li abudullaha mukhlisina lahu dina hunafa wa yuqimu salat wa yu'tu zakata wa dalika wa dalika dinu qayyima. That's the upright religion. That's the religion Allah loves. Sincerity. That's the first thing they come with. The second thing they come with is al mutaba'a. Everything that they want to do, they ask, has the Prophet وسلم, legislated this? Has the Messenger وسلم, sanctioned this? They are people who follow that legislation. Every action that you want to do, if you're not doing it with sincerity and you're not following the messenger in it, it is not accepted. Allah said in the ayah, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا وَلَا يُشْرِكْ بِعِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ أَحَدًا Ibn Kathir said, when he came to that ayah, that this ayah is referring to anyone who wants Allah and the Day of Judgment. These are the two things Allah mentioned in that ayah. In accordance to how the Prophet did it and sincerity. Once you do your action based on that, then and only sincerity and in accordance to the Sunnah will it be accepted. So they are people who have sincerity and they also are in accordance to the way that the Prophet Sallallahu did it. Naam. They are a people in all of their affairs. Mustashibina wa mulazimina lil khawfi wal raja. Everything that they do, everything that they say, they are always fearful and they are what? Scared and hopeful. They are fearful and they are hopeful. Every situation they're in. Why are they scared? Um, what makes them scared and what makes them, what brings uh, hope to them? They are scared when they look at their, themselves. Pay attention. When they look at themselves and they look at their shortcomings in the rights of Allah Azza wa Jalla, they get scared. Like why? Why have I done this? So remember, when you look at yourself, when you look at your shortcomings, you're looking at, Allah says in the ayah, If Allah was to grab the people every time that they did a sin, every time we done a mistake, if Allah was to grab us, Allah will never have left anyone on the face of this earth. How merciful he is. He's letting you live after you've committed crimes. You've went against his come you went against what he told you. So when they look at themselves, they get scared. And then when they look at Allah and his blessings and how merciful he is and how kind he is, they start to receive hope. So those are the two things that they have. They have fear and they also have hope. The fear comes to them when they look at themselves and their own actions and how they're falling short and they become happy and hopeful when they look at Allah and how kind He is and how generous He is. Also when they ponder over Allah's names, Allah has names like justice or characteristics which is justice. Allah is Adil, Adil, He's just subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they look at that characteristics, they know from the justice of Allah is anyone who commits a crime he deserves to be punished. When they look at that, they become scared. And when they look at his names like merciful, kind, generous, they become very hopeful. So whatever they, whatever they do, they are either scared or they are ho uh, fearful. Or they are fearful or they are hopeful. Anyone who just takes one and leaves the other one will always fall, sh will all always fall short in their actions. Some of the groups, they came and they only took one characteristic and they abandoned the other one. The Muslim should take all of that. He should be scared of Allah. He should hope from Allah. 
and we'll see the other one coming, and the other one, inshallah ta'ala, the author is going to mention it now, that you have love. Those are the three that you need. Fear, hope, and what? Love. If that's balanced out, you will definitely get to Allah wa ta'ala, and the journey, the journey, that's what the book is called, journey. That's where you'll reach your journey, your, your destination. Naam. The author, he says, Their hearts have become filled up with the love of Allah wa ta'ala. They love him subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are excessively in love with him. The person who is in love with Allah wa ta'ala, the way that you know he loves Allah is, his heart is connected to the one he loves. He's connected to it subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he doesn't sit in a gathering. He's not in a particular place except that he's talking about the one he loves. The poet, he said, there was a man, he was in love with a woman. And then he said, أُقَبِّلُ ذَا الْجِدَارِ وَذَا الْجِدَارِ I kissed this wall, and I kissed this wall. وَمَا الْجِدَارُ شَفَقْنَ قَلْبِي But it's not the love of the walls that have filled my heart. وَلَكِنْ لِمَنْ سَكَنَ الْدِيَارِ The person who used to live in these walls is the one I love. You see? So the person who's in love, whose heart is full of love, and is in love, he's always going to talk about the one he loves. He can't stop it, however much he wants. Because he's in love. فَإِن تَكَلَّمَ تَكَلَّمَ بِاللَّهِ If he speaks, he speaks for Allah تبارك وتعالى وَإِن سَكَتَ سَكَتَ لِلَّهِ If he's silent, he's silent for Allah تبارك وتعالى وَإِن تَحَرَّكَ فَلِلَّهِ If he moves, he moves for Allah's sake وَإِن سَكَنَ فَلَهُ If he's calm and he doesn't move, he does it for Allah تبارك وتعالى All of that is based on the love that he has for his Lord Allah سبحانه وتعالى The question here is, how can one attain that love? What is the, if the, if the goal is to gain love, then how can one attain that love? How can one receive it? The author is going to mention it in the next line, how to gain the love of Allah Tabaraka wa ta'ala. This is the way to gain the love of Allah, and that is dhikr, remembering Him subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time. وَهُمُ الَّذِينَ They are the ones. أَكْثَرُ مِنْ ذِكْرِهِ they're always remembering him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fisirri when they are private. Wal-i'lani. And when they are in public and they are in front of the people. They are always what? They are always remembering him subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is truly a manzilatun sharifa. This is a high station. Which is to always remember Allah. Allah said in the Quran. Ya ayu alladheena amanu. Those of you who believe. Udhkuru Allah. Remember Allah. Dhikran kathira. Remember Allah tabarak wa ta'ala a lot. وَسَبِّحُوهُ بُكْرَةً وَأَصِيلًا And exalt him subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said to the Prophet, إِنَّ شَرَائِعَ الْإِسْلَامِ قَدْ كَثُرَتْ عَلَيَّ The legislations of the religion has become too much. He's a simple man. He can't keep up with all of these fiqh issues. So he said, O Messenger of Allah, the legislations and the issues related to the religion are too much. I can't keep up with it. I don't know all of these intrinsic details. I don't know all of that. فَأَوْصِنِي Advise me with something. I'm a simple man. Just something I can hold on to. The messenger then said to him, لَا يَزَالُ لِسَانُكَ رَطْبًا مِنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Don't let your tongue dry from the remembrance of Allah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in another hadith, سَبَقَ الْمُفَرِّدُونَ The Mufarridun have passed everybody else. So the Sahabas, they said, وَمَا الْمُفَرِّدُونَ Who are the Mufarridun or Messenger of Allah? And the Prophet said, أَذَّاكِرُونَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَالذَّاكِرَاتِ they are the ones who remember Allah. They are the men who remember Allah a lot and the female who remember Allah a lot. They've passed everyone else. They might physically be with you, but they're not. They're not with you. They, you might think they're walking around you, but their levels and their stations that they're moving is great. But Idarika the Sheikh has another book, which he called it Manhajul Haq. He summarized some of the benefits, some of the benefits that are in dhikr. I'm going to read it on you, inshallah ta'ala. And we'll explain that book another time. He says, وَكُنْ ذَاكِرًا لِلَّهِ فِي كُلِّ حَالَةٍ فَلَيْسَ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَقْتٌ مُقَيَّدُ فَذِكْرُ إِلَهِ الْعَرْشِ سِرًّا وَمُعْلَنًا يُزِيلُ الشَّقَى وَالْهَمَّ عَنْكَ وَيَطْرُدُ وَيَجْلُبُ لِلْخَيْرَاتِ دِينًا وَآجِلًا وَإِنْ يَتِكَ الْوَسْوَاسُ يَوْمًا يُشَرَّدُ فَقَدْ أَخْبَرَ الْمُخْتَارُ يَوْمًا لِصَحْبِهِ بِأَنَّ كَثِيرَ الذِّكْرِ فِي السَّبْقِ مُفْرِدُ 
ووصى معاذا يستعين إلهه على ذكر والشكر بالحسن يعبد وأوصى لشخص قد أتى لنصيحة وقد كان في حمل الشرائع يجهد بأن لم يزل رطبا لسانك هذه تعين على كل الأمور وتسعد وأخبر أن الذكر غرس لأهله بجنات عدن والمساكن تمهد وأخبر أن الله يذكر عبده ومعه على كل الأمور ويسدد وأخبر أن الذكر يبقى بجنة وأخبر أن الذكر يبقى بجنبه وينقطع التكليف حينا يخلد ولو لم يكن في ذكره غير أنه طريق إلى حب الإله ومرشد وينهى الفتى عن غيبة ونميمة وعن كل قول الديان مفسد وينهى الفتى عن غيبة ونميمة وعن كل قول للديانة مفسد لكان لنا حظ عظيم ورغبة بكثرة ذكر الله نعم الموحد ولكننا من جهلنا قل ذكرنا كما قل منا للإله التعبد He says رحمه الله وكن ذاكرا be one who remembers Allah a lot في كل حالة in every situation فليس لذكر الله for the remembrance of Allah there is no restricted time for it فذكر إله العرش سرا ومعلنا remember Allah in private and in public يزيل الشقاء it will remove from you the disease of the heart depression, sadness, anxieties also being from the people of the hellfire it will protect you from that يزيل الشقاء والهم عنك ويطرد ويجلب للخيرات it will bring your way good so much good that you're looking for it will bring it your way وإن يأتك الوسواس يوما يشرد whispers if it comes to you just do the dhikr it will all go it won't last فقد أخبر المختار نبي الله محمد has told us يوما one day لصحبي to the companions بأن كثير الذكر في السبق مفرد just the hadith that I read سبق المفردون he told his companions that the ones who remember Allah a lot have passed everybody else ووصى معاذا حين ووصى معاذا the messenger advised معاذ يستعين إلهه معاذ did the prophet not come to him and he said to him say to him يا معاذ إني لا أحبك معاذ I love you فلا تدعنا do not leave off after every salah to say اللهم اللهم إني على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك that's what he's talking about here ووصى معاذا ووصى معاذا يستعين إلهه على ذكره والشكر بالحسن يعبد ووصى لشخص the prophet advised a man he said قد أتاه لنصيحة a man who came for advice who said to him the religion is too much for me I can't do it the sheikh is saying to you the prophet advised him to do dhikr he said to him بأن لم يزل رطبا لسانك هذه don't let this tongue of yours become dry from the remembrance of Allah سبحانه وتعالى تعين على كل الأمور وتسعده it will help you your happiness will be connected to it وأخبر the prophet told us أن الذكر غرس لأهله the prophet told us that every time you make dhikr it's like you're planting onto this into jannah the dhikr is the flowers that are being made in your garden in Jannah. The Prophet told us alayhi salatu wasalam. وَأَخْبَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَذْكُرُ عَبْدَهُ That when you make so much dhikr, Allah will remember you in a better place than where you are. وَأَخْبَرَ أَنَّ الذِّكْرَ يَبْقَى And he also told us that the remembrance of Allah will remain forever. وَلَوْ لَمْ يَكُنْ فِي ذِكْرِ غَيْرَ أَنَّهُ The Shaykh then said, if there was no other benefit in the remembrance of Allah, there was no benefit in it. Except what? غَيْرَ أَنَّهُ طَرِيقٌ That is the path إلى حب الإله in the love in the love of Allah ومرشد أن is the thing to guide you وينها أن it will also prevent you from الفتى عن غيبة ونميمة if you busy yourself with ذكر it will prevent you from backbiting tail bearing وعن كل قول للديانة مفسد and everything that can harm your religion if you just do ذكر you busy yourself with it you won't you won't see yourself talking about unnecessary stuff so this is inshallah تعالى some of the benefits. I advise you all, if you can buy the kitab written by Ibn al-Qayyim, it's called Al-Wabil al-Sayyib. Ibn al-Qayyim mentions 70 benefits of dhikr. 70 benefits in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaykh al-Islam Taymi said something very powerful about dhikr. He said, Al-Dhikr lil-Qalbi mithlu al-Ma'i lil-Samaki. The dhikr is for the heart, like the water is for the fish. فَكَيْفَ يَكُونُ حَالُ السَّمَكِ How is the situation of the fish going to be إِذَا فَارَقَ الْمَاءِ If he leaves the water. It will die. So will your heart die. 
ولذلك ابن القيم also said وحضرت شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية مرة صلى الفجر ابن القيم said one day I came ابن القيم is saying one day I came to شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية he prayed صلاه الفجر ثم جلس يذكر الله and he remained in his place to do dhikr إلى قريب من تصاف النهار until half of the day ثم التفت إلي ثم ثم التفت إلي then he looked at me وقال he then said to me هذه غدوتي this is my breakfast ولو لم أتغدى هذا هذا الغداء سقطت قوتي this is my this is my breakfast if I don't do this I become weak and I will drop ولذلك one of the things that Sheikh Islam Taymiyyah was seen was that when he fought with the Tatar, he was more physically stronger than everybody else, even though he wasn't a person who used to eat much. And so Ibn al-Qayyim said, I could only interpret that to mean that he was a man who was excessive in his dhikr. The physical strength that he had, rahimahullah. Now. The Shaykh rahimahullah, he said, they get closer to Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala in doing righteous actions. The first thing that you can get closer to Allah is number one, do the obligatory things. Don't think about voluntary. First start with the obligatory things. Because of the hadith, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَدْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ The thing that Allah loves and that is pleasing to him and that should be number one is that which is made obligatory on you. وَلَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلِ And then the nawafil comes. The voluntary act comes. It comes after. First, and foremost is what? It is the obligatory things. Naam. They are a people, their life is between obligatory acts and voluntary acts. فِعْلُ الْفَرَائِضِ وَالنَّوَافِلِ دَعْبُهُمْ مَعْرُؤِيَةِ التَّقْسِيرِ وَالنُّقْصَانِ They do فِعْلُ الْفَرَائِضِ They do the obligatory. And they do the voluntary. And guess what? They still see themselves to be deficient. They're like, well, I haven't done anything. May Allah forgive me. ولذلك the day of judgment, the angels who Allah created in the state of prostration, Allah created them in state of prostration. It will be said that the day of judgment, they will raise their heads. And they will look at Allah wa ta'ala, they will move from that position that they've never moved from. And they will say, Subhanak Allahumma. They say, exalted you are our, our Lord. Ma abadnaka haqqa ibadatik. We have not worshipped you the way you deserve to be. The way you deserve to be worshipped. That's what they would say. First thing that they say, they raise up from their head, and the first thing that they say is, Oh Allah, we have not worshipped you the way that you, you deserve to be worshipped. And then these people, they come with actions, obligatory acts, voluntary acts, ma'adhalika, with that said, they see themselves to be deficient. They don't think they've done anything. They're crying at night, weeping, asking Allah for forgiveness. And in the daytime, they are fasting. They are praying their salawat in jama'ah. فِعْلُ الْفَرَائِضِ وَالنَّوَافِلِ دَعْبُهُمْ Doing the obligatory acts, and the voluntary act is their da'b. Da'b means their norms, their norms. It's normal for them. It's like breathing. مَعْرُؤْيَةِ التَّقْسِيرِ وَالنُقْصَانِ And they still see that they are deficient, and they are not to the standard that was needed from them. And so they blame themselves. Always they're blaming themselves. Why don't you do this? Why don't you correct yourself? وَلِذَلِكَ Some of the Salaf, it was said, when they used to pray Qiyamun Layl, they used to have a stick next to, their head, next to their, themselves. And so whenever their legs would stop standing, they'll take the stick and they'll hit their legs. And they'll say to their, their legs, Qum! Qum! Stand up! Do you want to compete with Muhammad and his companions in Jannah? Look what they're looking at. Are you with me, brothers? That's, they've done all of that and they're still going. They're still seeing themselves to be deficient. And that they haven't. Sufyan ibn Sufyan al-Thawri, ma'a imamatihi, how high he was in level, all the good that he's done. When he was on his deathbed, he akhadha tibratan min al he took a, a, a little twig of, of the earth. And then he said, Rahimahullah, I just wish I could be like this, that Allah can forgive me. Like I'm just nothing for, you know, just Allah forgives me for everything I did. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, what did he say? I wish I was a ram, that a family slaughtered me and ate me, and then I didn't come the day of judgment. No accountability, nothing. Just I, I was left alone. I just wish that could be my case. So, فِعْلُ الْفَرَائِضِ وَالنَّوَافِلِ دَعْبُهُمْ مَعَ رُؤْيَةِ التَّقْصِيرِ وَالنُّقْصَانِ Naam. 
They came with patience. They're very patient people. The word patience, it means hapsun nafsi, is to imprison the nafs. It is to imprison your nafs and then it's to drag your nafs to what it doesn't like. That's what patience is. It's to prison your nafs and then it's to drag it to which it does not like, but rather what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The patience is three types and they come with all three types of patience. First type of patience is patience in doing that which is pleasing to Allah wa ta'ala. Those things which are hard for them to do, to get up for fajr, to do wudu, to, all of this might be hard for them. They come with it. They also come with the second type of patience which is to be patient from the sins that which the nafs wants and the nafs is calling them to they are patient from it and they are also patient from the calamities that are thrown at them the calamities that they go through they are patient from it that's what they come with Naam. The Shaykh Rahimahullah said, Nazalu bi manzilati rida fahum biha. These people are, are stationed higher. Patience on the calamities that, that befall you is, is a powerful station. But to be pleased with it is a high station. To be pleased with the calamity is another level. This is where they go. These people have moved the station up. They've reached a point where they are pleased with everything Allah puts them through. They're pleased with it. They're happy. You see? So they've become what? They are in paradise. If you're pleased with everything Allah does to you, your heart is content. You're not going to tackle and argue with the qadr. The ones who are, are they have depression and stress and anxiety, is the one who's not content with what his creator has set for him. These people are pleased, they're happy. When they're informed about it, they are happy. Walidalika, some of the scholars, they called the station of a rida they called it Jannah to dunya. It's the Jannah of the dunya, wa mustarahul abideen, and it's where the comfort of the worshippers of Allah find. They're very happy. Whatever Allah is pleased with, is what they are pleased with. Naam. They come with another station of gratitude. They are a people who have gratitude. That's in their heart. And then it manifests on their limbs. Because shukur is not just what's in your heart. It's also on your tongue. And it's also on your limbs. So they show gratitude in those three places, brothers. How do they do it in their hearts? They believe that هذا من عند الله. This is from Allah Azza wa Jalla. They also mention it on their tongue. وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ إِشْ فَحَدِّثْ They talk about the blessings of their Lord. They say, Allah has blessed me with this. And the third thing is, they physically use that. They physically use the blessings of Allah in that which is pleasing to Him. You're not grateful, Wallahi, to the blessings of Allah that He's given you if you're using it in that which He does not like, in that which angers Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's given you those eyes and you're using it for haram. He's given you your ears and you're using it for haram. He's given you this mouth and you're speaking with haram. If you want to show gratitude, Use those limbs in that which is pleasing to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. They come with two things. At-tawakkul ala Allah. They come with tawakkul in Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala, the author is mentioning here. Wal-ijtihadu fi ta'atillah. And they exert their efforts in the obedience of their Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pay attention. Tawakkul, brother, means two things. Tawakkul is when two things are found. The first one is Al-I'timadu ala Allah. It is that you rely on Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. You believe in Him, you rely on Him, you trust Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you also come with the efforts and the hard work. You exert the effort and the hard work and you believe in Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and you trust Him. But if you sit back and you don't do anything, that's not tawakkul. Tawakkul means that you believe in Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. You trust Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you also are what? You're exerting the effort and the hard work. That's what they do. Sahibut tawakkula fi jami'i umurihim. 
مع بذل جهد في في رضا الرحمن and they exert their efforts to make Allah tabarak wa ta'ala happy every day they are looking for whatever is going to make their lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy naam these people what they've done is abadul ilaha they worshiped Allah tabarak wa ta'ala ala atiqad huzurihi like Allah is the one that they can see they worship Allah like they can see him and if they can't see him they know he can see them and this is the level called what al ihsan fatabawwa'u fi manzil al ihsan they have stayed at that station of ihsan and ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tara you worship Allah as though you can see him as the highest level if you can't fa in lam takun tarahu fa innahu yarak if you can't see him then Allah can see you subhanahu wa ta'ala that's how they live their life wa lidhalika some of the scholars they said that when Allah came to the ayah, when it comes to the ayah inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan Allah commands you adl and ihsan what does it mean al adl an yastawi sariratuka wa alaniyatuka adl means justice fairness your private affairs and your public affairs is the same and ihsan is when your private affairs is more stronger than your public affairs that's the level they reach the ihsan in Allah ya'muru bil adl wal ihsan ihsan is when your private affairs it's unprecedented you are doing so much to yourself that's what these people are at night time when it enters they are to their lord allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they turn towards him their hearts in is present they don't pray salah and then they're, they're absent minded no abadul ilaha ala atiqad huzurihi they are present they are aware of their lord allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may allah make us from those people They sincerely advise the people. If they see evil, they tell the people, stay away from this evil. Because they want to please Allah. Anything in this world that's happening that's not right, that Allah is not happy with, they advise the people. Because they know it's pleasing to Allah that things are rectified. Are you with me, brothers? Again, I just recently read a story and I told you about it. The story of Abu Umar al-Maqdisi rahimahullah. You see, Abu Umar al-Maqdisi was said that he used to sincerely advise and he was a sincere advisor to the people to the extent that the leaders used to say, هَذَا الرَّجُلِ شَرِيكٌ فِي مُلْكِي This man has ownership with me in my lead kingdom. The way he used to like, advise people, he was a sincere advisor. He would go to the creation of Allah and he would tell them, stay away from this. Because all he wants to see is that which is going to make his Lord happy. Because he knows Allah doesn't like this and he angers him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he wants to rectify and correct all of that. That's what the author says. Nasahul Khaliqata. They advise the creation. Fi rida mahbubihim. To please their Lord Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. But how do they do it? Bil ilmi wal irshadi wal ihsani. They do it with knowledge. And they guide in the best way. And they do it with excellence. You see? Sahibul khalaiqa. This is powerful brothers. They befriend the people. Their bodies are with the people. Sahibul khalaiqa bil jusumi wa innama arwahuhum fi manzil fawqani. They're physically with the people, but their souls, it's just dwelling in Jannah. That's where, they, that, that's where they are really at. You're talking to them, but they're absent-minded because they're just connected to their Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all they're thinking about. How can I make ajr? How can I make reward? I've seen with my eyes, some people of knowledge, wallahi, every movement they were doing, it's like a checklist for them. They, they are working. You know how someone's always trying to invest money, this and that, how we do in the dunya. We want to invest and make money and how much profit I can make. For him, every day he wakes up, that's what he's thinking about. Today, what can I do? How can I get this? Every single day. That's what he's thinking about. You know, he smiles in a Muslim brother's face. It's, he's aware of it. We are even absent when we say to somebody, Jazakallahu khairan wa alaykum as -salam. We're absent-minded because it doesn't have much value to us. Like in these people, everything is a, is a level. It's the other side. It's the other side. So they're working very hard when others are not choosing to. Naam. Do 
the author rahimahullah he said billahi da'watu al-khala'iq kulliha khawfan 'ala al-imani min nuqsani they are a people they're always pondering over their own affairs they're always thinking about themselves like where have i once upon a time been where am i now where am i heading what's going wrong where do i why am i not why am i not perfecting my iman why am i still struggling in these sins to accountability that's what they consistently do they always count themselves they stop themselves and they say i need to think they observe their actions they want to think about what made the iman increase what made the in decrease the iman decrease they always think about it the author then says azaful quluba an shawaghil kulliha they took their hearts away from all of the things that preoccupy them qad farraghuha min siwar rahmani the only person who they've made their hearts for is allah this heart of theirs everyone is outside it only allah has it nothing else everything else for them is replaceable not allah azza wa jalla only allah lives in their hearts subhanahu wa ta'ala harakatum their movements wa humumuhum wa uzum if you see them distressed it's because of that it's because of a, a good act they could have done today they missed they're like today i'm i missed the jama'ah didn't make it in time this is what they worry about وَعُزُومُهُمْ لِلَّهِ لَا لِلْخَلْقِ وَالشَّيْطَانِ All of that is for Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. In other words, they are people who are aesthetic. They're very aesthetic. The dunya doesn't mean anything to them. It holds no weight to them. Has no value to them. You with me, brothers? وَلِذَلِكَ Again, the story I read. Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama is the father of ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi. The author of the 30 volumes, that is, that's his father. He ran away from Baytul Maqdis and he came to Damascus. Damascus. When he came, there was a long story of what happened to him. Like in, he made it to a masjid and the masjid, the leader at that time, some of you might know who he is, um, Nuruddin Az-Zinki, rahimahullah. Nuruddin Az-Zinki was the leader at that time. And Nuruddin Az-Zinki came and visited Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Qudama in his masjid. And he gave him the endowment the awqaf, he placed it into his hand and he said, do what you wish. You know what he said? He pushed it out and he said, I didn't leave Baytul Maqdis I didn't leave Baytul Maqdis so I can come here to compete with the people in their dunya. That's not what I came here for. I'm not here to compete with the people's dunya. And he pushed it away and he left it. Rahimahullah. And when he died, they said, he used to pray 72 rak'ah every single day, voluntary. 72 rak'ah, voluntary, every single day. Rahimahullah. So he, the older he got, he put his children in charge, and he used to lock himself in a room, and he would sit there and do ibadah, and dhikr, and adhkar, and Quran, and everything. Rahimahumullah. May Allah be pleased with all of them. So the first thing they did is, they disconnected their hearts from the dunya. They got rid of this. This dunya, leave it. Get away from it. Go towards your akhirah. What you work for this dunya, let it be what's going to help you for your akhirah. That's the truth of it, wallah. Naam. <laughs> These are the type of people that you want to be with. These are the type of people you want to befriend, brothers. These are the type of people who are الصالحين. الله تبارك وتعالى يسر إني آية أولئك الذين أنعم الله عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا. Those are the best people to be in their company. They're the people when you're with them, they're going to put you through those stations and those levels. الله أسأل. I ask Allah تبارك وتعالى بأسماء الحسن وصفاته وصفاته العلا ألا يحرمنا خير ما عنده من الإحسان والغفران. بشر ما عندنا من التقصير بحقوقه والعصيان ويجعله خالصا لوجه الكريم وسببا للفوز عنده في جنات النعيم والحمد لله رب العالمين أولا وآخرا وظاهرا وباطنا حمدا كثيرا مباركا فيه كما ينبغي لكرم وجهه وعز جلاله سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أستغفرك أتوب لك